presentation. My name's Darren Anderson. I'm the, the competitions manager um, for Crete Victoria. Uh, also on the, the line, we have Paul Milo, who is head of member services, and a number of, another, uh, number of other CV staff um, who are also online and will assist in answering any questions as we go through um, via the chat function, or they'll jump in at certain times if need be. Over the past few weeks, we've run a number of webinar uh, sessions for associations, clubs, local councils, and uh, earlier today, we also ran a, our first session for community umpires about the implications of COVID-19 for the upcoming season. Today, we felt it was important to share this information with the umpiring fraternity to hopefully provide some clarity about what to expect for the season uh, and a few of the match day protocols and playing conditions, which all competitions will need to be adhering to, um, whether that's seniors or juniors, to be able to return to play. We'll just ask everyone to make sure that they are on mute. Um, there's a bit of feedback coming through. Moving through to a, a little bit of housekeeping. Again, we ask everyone to remain on mute. Um, it helps with people being able to, to hear the presentation um, and also turn the microphone, uh, turn the videos off as this assists people with the internet connectivity issues. Ordinarily, people with a question would raise their hand or signal by for an umpire. Um, however, tonight we request that any questions are typed into the chat function, which is located on the icon shown on the screen. Um, however, we do ask that we limit the sledging. Before we kick off, uh, whilst we're meeting online uh, this evening, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of the various lands on which this meeting is taking place and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and those on the call today. We've obviously received a number of questions um, from people during the registration process and we'll look to cover off all these questions during the session. A few of the things that we will tick off on are the roadmap to return for community cricket, what to expect when we return to the field of play. We'll also provide an overview on the role of the umpire and also some clarity on the hot topic of face masks. We'll then cover off on COVID match day rules, which will be enforced at all levels. And these include handling and cleaning the ball, player clothing and equipment, coin toss, team selection, afternoon tea and drinks, player distancing, sweat and saliva on the ball, uh, rule breaches and enforcement, uh, some other useful resources and, and where you can find them, and then finally a session at the end to answer any questions uh, if they may not have been answered or that, that come up throughout the, the session. Um, please refrain from uh, entering questions in the, uh, in the chat uh, until we've covered off on those areas on the agenda, uh, because the majority of things that you've got uh, we will have um, ticked off on. Darren, I'll just, the right Darren, I'll just call here. I'll just jump in. Yep. The PowerPoint presentation doesn't seem to be up. Um, they've got a couple of um, uh, questions there that we can't see the PowerPoint. Uh, okay. Um, can can you see the PowerPoint, Paul? No, I can't. I, I can. You can? Maybe it's just me. That's yeah. fine. I, if everyone right. can. I can see it. Loud okay. and clear. Beautiful. All right, that's fine. I'll, uh, I can't see okay. it. I'll, uh, I'll jump off. I can jump say it. Jump off audio for everyone and uh, jump back onto mute and we'll keep going. No worries. Uh, thanks for all the people who put it in chat. We've uh, established that we've we've got the the visual, so we'll we'll keep going. So the roadmap to to return for for community cricket. Um, uh, currently in uh, metropolitan Melbourne, we're in step two. And uh, and that basically means there's, there's no um, sanctioned cricket training and matches allowed in step two. Uh, we can go out and um, partake in, um, in outdoor activities in, in groups of up to five people, but it's from a maximum of two, uh, two households. And, uh, and at the moment, we're still working through the, the turf wicket preparation in some local councils, and uh, there's limited access uh, to, to school ovals. And uh, as we know, there's a, a bit of a ring of steel between the, the metropolitan regional borders and uh, we can't uh, cross over. At the moment in step three, which is where regional Victoria currently is, they can actually return to train and return to play um, as of, uh, well, realistically as of last week. Um, however, training must be kept in groups of, uh, of 10 
and uh, and matches, however, can be played in the minimum number required um, to participate. So that, if that's 11 v 11, well, then that's allowed for, for matches, but training is uh, condensed to, to 10, um, 10 people per group. So this information we've covered off on with, um, with the clubs and associations. Um, and as we progress through the steps, you'll see that the, the restrictions are eased and uh, more and more people can gather in groups. And uh, hopefully we can then get back to operating in a fashion which is a little bit closer to normal for, for clubs, umpires and, uh, and associations. Season expectations this year, um, and, and it's one of the big things that we're, we're letting people know is cricket in a pandemic is a privilege. It, it's not a right, and uh, and given that we've seen an entire winter sports season uh, wiped out with uh, with COVID-19, the fact that we're actually getting the opportunity to return to the field and play um, is a privilege, and we need to do everything we can um, working together to ensure that we remain out on the field. So that means doing the right things, following the protocols, and, um, and and just basically getting out there and enjoying the game of cricket. The advice we're giving to clubs is get in, play and get out. So that limits the ability for them to have social activities and, and hanging around late after games into the night. Uh, it makes it more work for volunteers and, uh, and the cleaning and, and check-in protocols that are involved um, with people being at the club uh, are exacerbated to this. So realistically, get in, Get the game over and done with, and then uh, and then head home. For umpires, forget what you've seen on TV. Uh, millions of dollars are being spent on biosecurity and quarantining for for tournaments. The IPL, uh, the Test series over in the UK, and and the One Day series Australia have just played against England. Um, these players are in quarantine hubs. They're getting tested for COVID multiple times throughout the week, and they've got strict protocols in place. Hence, the reason why they are able to have a little more, a little bit more of liberty with regards to putting sweat on the ball. Um, however, in community cricket in Victoria, that won't be happening. So there will be a few more stricter protocols, and uh, and for one, sweat and saliva won't be allowed on the ball, and we'll discuss that a little bit later uh, in the presentation. Also, expect a bit of clunkiness this year. There's going to be significantly more stoppages, cleaning and handling of the ball, um, access to facilities. So cricket won't be what we normally expect, where we rock up and everything's there and we can enjoy the afternoon. There's going to be a little bit more stricter protocols on how we access facilities, um, what we need to do out on the ground and the stoppages that take place for, for whether it's cleaning the ball or um, talking with players about behaviour and all that sort of thing. So just work with it and enjoy being out there, but most importantly, stay safe. The role of the umpire, whilst we've spoken about how cricket will be different this year to what we normally expect, the role of the umpire will pretty much be no different to a normal season. 95% of everything will be the same, but there'll be a few slight changes to what we experience on a match day. Keeping the game moving is going to be really important, and this is the umpire's main job. Make sure that with the number of stoppages that take place and the disruptions to play, we're encouraging the players to keep the match moving. Don't prolong the breaks more than needed, and, uh, and that way we can get in and we can get out at a reasonable time. Arrive ready to umpire. Some places, depending on where the local council allow it, won't have change, uh, change facility access. Some will have limited change facility access. So the suggestion is rock up in your umpiring attire ready to go. Make sure you communicate clearly with captains and players. That makes sure that we're uh, constantly on time and, and running to schedule, but also means that they're aware of any issues that come up, whether that be player behaviour, any warnings that might um, be required to be given on the basis of sweat and saliva, which we'll discuss. But having that open communication with the players on the field will make the game move a lot easier. We're not expecting umpires to police the procedures for every club. So basically, if there's something going on that you think there's a significant issue with from what the protocols require, put it in your captain's report and allow the association to address the issue. But we're not expecting you to go out there and police every aspect of the game and every rule uh, for returning to play. And then finally, check in and check out. Every club is required to keep a uh, attendance register. Um, so that way, if there's a need to contact Trace, uh, they've got a list of the people that were at the facility at a certain time. So majority of clubs will be using a QR code and umpires simply use their smartphone to check in um, with the, the QR code and check out. And you simply put your first name and mobile number. 
if you don't have a smartphone, someone from the home club will be able to assist in entering your details so that you're covered if uh, there's a need for contact tracing. The big issue that's come up over the last few weeks is face masks and Cricket Victoria has advocated on behalf of the sport to the state government to have exemptions for umpires to not wear a face mask when out in the field. We raise the OHS issues as well as communication decision making impairments. So in cricket speak, I guess that you could say we asked for the DRS from the DHHS in this respect, hoping to get the green light. Unfortunately, however, the red light's been shown. And as the communication we've received back is that all umpires must wear a mask on the field unless they can provide a medical exemption. So we recommend people jumping on the DHHS website to check out the face coverings and face mask requirements and see what exemptions are in place. And that might be for people that have a medical condition that limits their ability to wear a mask. And if that's the case, do make sure you get a bit of documentation saying that to take to game so that people are aware of what the issue is. Also, if you're umpiring in a competition where people have hearing impairment, I know there's um, the, the, the Melbourne Deaf Cricket Club um, participate in Metropolitan Melbourne. We'd expect those games where the umpires wouldn't need to wear a face mask because being able to lip read is really important um, for the deaf community and, um, and that just helps with that communication there. So check with your local associations about that um, to, to find out what those requirements would be. But unfortunately, at this stage, it is that every umpire whilst on the field needs to wear a mask. Players who are participating on the field, whether that's batters or fielders, will be exempt from wearing a face mask. However, if one of the players is standing at square leg or main umpire, um, they will be required to wear a mask. Um, and the reason behind this is the exercise rule. So as part of the face covering um, protocols, if you're um, likely to partake in um, physical exertion or exercise, you're exempt from wearing a mask and it's considered that the players out on the field uh, would need to run and chase the ball or run between the wicket, hence the reason why they've been given that exemption. We know the argument about first slip can potentially sit there all day and, and not move. However, there is opportunities where the first slip may have to chase the ball regularly down to the boundary at third man. So hence the reason why they've been given those exemptions. We understand it's not an ideal situation. Um, however, as the, the laws of cricket say, we must accept the umpire's decision, in this case, the state government for now and not argue the point. So we will keep advocating on easing this rule with the state government, um, but we just need to accept this for now and, uh, and get on with playing cricket. Moving through to the match day rules. With regards to the ball, umpires cannot touch the ball at any stage this year. So whether that is at the fall of a wicket, in between overs, during a drinks break, the umpires aren't allowed to touch the ball. When a wicket falls or at the end of an over, the ball's to be placed by the fielding team next to the stumps at the end in which the next ball is going to be bowled. The fielding captain will be responsible for cleaning the ball every 10 overs or a designated person by the fielding team because the captain may be a wicket keeper, for example. And they'll need to clean the ball with an alcohol-based sanitizer, either a wipe or spray. In junior cricket, the team manager may clean the ball on behalf of their team. If the ball is handled by a spectator, so someone in the crowd um, or a parent at a junior game and thrown back onto the field, the ball de does need to be wiped down or, or cleaned before the next ball can be bowled. Feedback from around the state so far is that the ball hasn't deteriorated too much and that sanitising has had minimal to no effect on the performance of the ball. If sweat or saliva is placed on the ball, the ball doesn't need to be replaced. It just simply needs to be cleaned. With regards to player clothing and equipment, Umpires are not to touch or hold any piece of player equipment or clothing. This includes caps, jumpers and sunglasses. These items are, be, are to be placed over the boundary or at a designated point on the field. The designated points are likely to be behind the keeper, similar to where the helmet and, and any shin guards would normally get placed, or directly behind the umpire at the bowler's end. These two places are considered to be the most like, likely to not come into um, interference with the ball in play. However, if the ball does hit these items, it's to be caught, declared dead and re -bowled. If a fielder, however, throws the ball into these items, it is play on because we don't want the loophole situation of a batter running three runs and the fielding team just throw the ball into the jumper for it to be called a dead ball and re -bowled. So if the ball is hit into these items, it's a dead ball and re -bowled. If the ball is thrown into it by the fielding team, well, then it's play on. However, the 
the rule of the ball hitting the helmet or protective equipment that a fielding team may have out on the field to field close to the batters still remains, and it's a five-run penalty. So this is all clear in the documentation that has been sent through to associations, and they'll communicate that out to their umpires, but it's also available in the resources that were sent through as pre-reading uh, for everyone tonight. Afternoon tea and drinks. There's to be no communal afternoon tea and, uh for, for anyone. So players, umpires, coaches are asked to bring their own food. With regards to drinks, everyone's expected to bring their own drink bottle and have that clearly labelled. The advice we're giving umpires is to ensure that their drink bottle's filled up during the session breaks so that when it comes time for the drinks break, it's full and it can either be brought out to the umpire as part of the, 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 the drink bottles that are brought onto the ground with a drink bottle holder or it's placed in an area where the umpire can quickly access it the field um, so that, that way it's kept cool for them. Coin toss, response, the umpire will be responsible for supplying the coin and flipping it. The away captain will then call. However, if the umpire doesn't produce the coin, well then it's up to the person who does produce the coin to toss it. So that way we're avoiding any contamination. There's to be no team sheets to change hands and clubs and associations have been advised that either team lists should be shown to the opposition captain and umpire prior to the toss via a smartphone with the team selected in my cricket already or for them to fill out a scorebook or team sheet and take out so that the umpires and opposition can, captain can cite the, the team sheet and team selected for the match and potentially take a photo of those names listed to keep it as a record. With regards to the stumps, the umpires are responsible for the stumps at their own end. So if there are two umpires allocated, they look after the stumps at their end um, throughout the match. And all they need to do is simply sanitise their hands after remaking the stumps if the player is out dismissed, bold, stumped or run out. Um, where there's only one umpire, it's advised that the square leg umpire is to either um, wipe the, the stumps or to sanitise their hands after remaking it. Now, we do understand that there's a few wicket keepers out there that like to whip bales off every second or third ball when they're up at the stumps. This is more than likely going to continue to happen, and we do need to keep following the protocols of just making sure you clean your hands. However, communicate with the wicket keepers the situation for this year and to try and avoid it as much as possible unless there's a, a dismissal uh, likely. With regards to sweat and saliva, as we said, it's not to be put on the ball at all. Um, and the sweat and saliva protocols, should it be placed on the ball, basically the umpires need to work through a, a bit of a workflow process. Was it done intentionally or unintentionally? And the document that was sent out prior to this as to what intentional and unintentional um, application is. Once that's been decided, you work through a, flow, uh, a, a, a workflow and it might be a first and final warning. It might be a five-run penalty, or if the breach is significant enough, it might be calling off the match and, and awarding a, the, the opposition um, the, the points due to a forfeiture. However, the most important thing throughout this is to make sure you're constantly communicating with the fielding team captain um, around warnings and any penalties that you put in place. However, we really do advise that you speak with your local association as to the process that they're wanting to do, whether it's a three-step approach, it's a two-step approach to give you a bit of guidance. Along with the resources that were sent out prior to this meeting, um, there are a number of other really beneficial places that you can go to get information. The COVID club and association plan that we sent through is in version two. We'll continue to update this um, as protocols and restrictions ease. Um, but at the moment, the information that's contained in there around match day is a really good one for the umpires to jump on. And it, the information that we spoke about tonight is covered in this document. There's also a frequently asked questions uh, page with about 42 questions that we've been asked throughout our, um, our webinars so far, and they contain detailed information and responses. The sweat and saliva playing conditions that were shared um, prior to the meeting are also up on this website, as well as a bit of an information around the QR code check-in process and, uh, and what clubs are doing with that. And there's a link to the Return to Cricket shop, which is where um, clubs and associations and umpires, if they like, can purchase sanitizer through Cricket Australia. However, this stuff's readily available through Chemist Warehouse um, and, and other places uh, that you, like Kmart, Coles, those sorts of places. As long as the sanitizer is at a minimum 70% uh, alcohol based, um, it is fine to, for use. 
And then finally, the roadmap for community cricket, which we discussed at the start of the session, is also available on the website. We'll continue to add resources to this as they um, they come up and information is gained from the state government, but it's a really good place to get the information you need around COVID because there's a lot of questions that have come out from clubs, associations, local governments, and even the session that we held earlier. Um, and it's a, a you'll be able to get the information and answers you need from these resources. That pretty much covers off a lot of the information that we wanted to, to put out there. And uh, we feel it's really important to be able to answer a number of the questions now that have come through the chat function to, to give clarity to everyone. So, Paul, I might hand over to you. Yeah, perfect, Darren. Um, you've, you've covered quite a fair bit through the sessions. And I think the the key one that we want to get across, and, and Darren spoke about it with um, uh, with masks and, and probably the sanitizer breaks as well, um, we are still in, uh, I guess, coming off the second wave in Melbourne. So... No doubt the state government is quite, um, uh, um, I guess, cautious, uh, as, we've, as we've all you know, seen living in Victoria, particularly for those that live in Melbourne. We know that it's been um, a very, very cautious approach. Um, like it or not, that's where we are at the moment. Um, but we do think as each fortnight, as each month uh, goes by, there'll be restrictions that'll be eased. We would suspect that um, uh, whether it's by Christmas or um, or even earlier, but uh, but there may be elements of the sanitizer breaks can be relaxed a bit. So if it's a 40 over one day, it might be just at the 20 over rub break. Those that are playing T20s, it might be just at the innings break. Similar, I guess, to masks. We will continue to go in and advocate uh, because we know that a lot of um, uh, umpires would prefer not to wear masks, and rightly so. We empathise with that. Um, we know it's a summer sport and standing out there, it's uncomfortable, glasses fogging up, those sort of things. So we've, we've continued to advocate um, for umpires in that space. We're more likely to get a better outcome and a better hearing in November or in December uh, from the, the state government. So we'll continue to um, uh, to advocate in, um, in, that, uh, in that. So there was a, another question about rationale behind umpires having to wear masks. So again, from the DHHS uh, position, compared to players, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Players may be asked to uh, to run, uh, and obviously bowlers and batters will be asked to run. Fielders may be asked to run. So the um, uh, the difference between batters, uh, or sorry, players and umpires, <clears throat> is their potential need to uh, to run is the key thing from um, uh, the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, yeah, that's a sort of the key difference there. Yeah, there's a couple of questions that have come in, Paul. Just while you've um been explaining that. So we've gone through the decision um, from the state government around masks. This is an Accrue Victoria decision. So um, that's what the decision is. It's for the safety uh, of everyone in the community. It's not just um, cricket umpires. And we all need to be doing our thing, given the fact that we are in the middle of a pandemic. Who's responsible for providing the sanitizer and wipes? Well, the club will be responsible for providing the wipes to clean the ball. However, we recommend that the umpires carry their own little sanitizer with them. It's pretty much what everyone does on a daily basis now, but that way they can just use their own sanitizer to for their hands. However, clubs will also have sanitizer available as part of the return to play protocols. Um, as, as Paul mentioned, um, there's no clothing to be placed on top of the helmet. Um, behind the wicketkeeper because, again, that's contamination with different people using the helmet and jumpers and that sort of thing. So they need to be kept separate. Um, Sanitisers and wipes won't be allowed to be kept on the field. So the, the players will either have that in their pocket. Um, the umpire can have it in their, their little, um, little bag if they're carrying a little bag, bum bag, out on the ground. Um, otherwise, everything else would need to be off the ground. So we're talking small little sanitizer bottles that fit in your pocket, not the big ones that are pump packs. Yep. Uh, um, can we still David's... use chalk? Just oh, no, go, sorry, go ahead, I was just going to answer the, the the chalk. The chalk yep. on the the synthetic for marking. Our advice is no, don't be using chalk on synthetic for marking. If there's a way that you can mark centre um, prior to the game, look at doing that. But again, the cross contamination of using chalk to to mark centre could be an issue, despite everyone wearing gloves. Uh, David um, has got another follow-up question about the umpires um, uh, again. So just for, for clarity, this uh, Department of Health and Human Services ruling, they've specifically been asked uh, via Creek Victoria to, to SRV in relation to can umpires not wear a mask, all of those elements about um, the age, etc. One of the, uh, I guess, the responses that came back from the Department of Health and Human Services is uh, if umpires are uh, older, uh, and the point that David says is uh, given our age, it's uh, strenuous, 
um, uh, it's a slightly more vulnerable group as well, um, uh, those that are older as well. So um, uh, the element of the mask is to, to help protect uh, not only other people around the person wearing the mask, but also the person wearing the mask as well. So um, again, it's a it's not a Cricket Victoria, it's not even a Support and Rec Victoria or opposition, it's directly come from the Department of Health and Human Services. So um, you know, we'll continue to, to advocate. We know, as we said earlier, umpires would prefer not to wear masks. We hope that position will change um, in the in the course of the next uh, month or so, but um, that's the current position from the state government. Um, so in terms of uh, uh, those elements of they do need to, to move out of the way of runouts, we absolutely get that. Uh, they need to wear um, uh, sunnies or glasses, we get that as well. We'll put into the chat, um, uh, there is a, um, a link on the DHHS website about um, um, some tricks, I guess, uh, to uh, to clean the glasses with uh, with soapy water. Uh, there's also a product um, uh, from Chemist Warehouse, so an anti-fog wipe as well that uh, that people can um, can use, and it's got good reviews for wearing glasses um, at the same time as masks uh, to help uh, with the uh, the fog as well. So we'll put that into uh, to the chat that people can um, uh, can look into. I saw there was a couple of questions about uh, cashless um, uh, payments. Ultimately, that's going to be for associations to to work through. We understand. The normal protocols of um, for a lot of associations paying cash on the day, we would advocate cashless, um, but it's for associations to work through. Now, whether that becomes a bit more clunky, as Darren said at the start of the uh, session, there'll be some clunky elements to to the process. But whether that becomes a situation where associations actually pay um, a direct uh, transfer into those umpires and invoice the clubs for that amount as opposed to the clubs passing that on to the umpires. Again, that's for associations to work through, but we would certainly advocate for cashless. It's not ruled out. It's not something that um, uh, is against um, uh, our or DHHS protocols. We would advocate for cashless though. Yeah, there's a couple of more questions come in. What about the if the stitching on the ball needs to be removed or inspected? Does the captain do this under umpire supervision? That would be our recommendation. However, if um, in the, the extenuating circumstances where the umpire needs to touch the ball, the recommendation is that they sanitise their hands straight away afterwards as opposed to wearing gloves. Um, is it unreasonable for umpires to assist, uh, insist on home club to sanitise stumps and bales pre-match? This is a requirement um, that uh, all clubs must um, clean and sanitise all equipment before and after um, play or, or training sessions and all that. So that will be done anyway. In New South Wales, the rules might be different depending on um, their state government rulings around face masks. So that um, that could be different. In New South Wales, they may not need to wear a face mask. So please make sure you, you follow it up with your local association um, around their state government protocols around what's meant to be happening. Um, there's a question there uh, from Lee about if a batsman is hearing impaired, can he ask the umpire to remove his mask so he's able to, to lip read? Um, uh, not sure necessarily that it's a, um, an absolute critical thing that they can lip read uh, every ball of the innings. Um, they can certainly uh, ask if, uh, if that's required. It does uh, mean that the non-striker, the bowler, the umpire, everyone is at a slightly increased risk of COVID. Um, obviously, if an umpire is giving you know, uh, wide snow balls, uh, uh, someone's out, um, they're using uh, hand signals, arm signals to do that. Um, so it may just be if they do need to communicate verbally to someone that's hearing impaired, they can lower the um, uh, the mask as opposed to taking it off for the entire uh, course of the innings. Um, so a little bit of a common sense one there, but um, uh, the batters uh, don't necessarily need to, uh, to lip read an umpire to, uh, to be able to complete their innings. Yep. Uh, if an umpire's glasses fog up, running to position for a run-out call, is it a dead ball or just not out? Um, I think someone's replied back perfectly. If you're in doubt, it's not out. So it's not a dead ball. It's just you you couldn't see it and it's, uh, it's not out. Can the players polish the ball with any part of um, his or her clothing at all? Yep, a dry polish is fine, provided they don't put sweat or saliva on the ball. We understand that this could be instinctive for, for players because it's what we've done for for over 100 years sort of thing. So making sure your communication around that is the most vital thing. So if a player does it accidentally, we saw it happen in the England game um, against the West Indies where I think Crawley um, accidentally put saliva on the ball. Just letting them know that that's a first warning. We can't do it, guys. Um, that's it. You clean the ball and then you move on. Um, Creek Victoria and the local comps won't be supplying um, 
face masks unless they come to an agreement with their local umpires association. So it's up to the umpires to supply their own face masks if your league or, or competition wants to supply them for you. Um, they're, they're entitled to do so. There's a great um, question. Mason, we're actually just talking about the same thing over the last uh, couple of days about uh, what would happen if cricket could start, uh, but the five kilometre is uh, not lifted. Um, clearly, from our point of view, we would see that as a, a ridiculous situation. We would strongly be uh, um, advocating for that, uh, that, um, that if cricket can start, we need to be able to travel more than five kilometres, and therefore that should be a legitimate reason to travel more than, um, than five kilometres. So... Under the current guidelines that are set down, um, the stated public uh, documents, it talks about no restrictions being in place at step three, which is hopefully in a couple of weeks' time for, uh, for Melbourne. But, um, but certainly, as a lot of us heard, the Premier did indicate um, the possibility of that five-kilometre rule staying. So it would be ridiculous if um, community sport can start, but the five-kilometre ruling is uh, still in place, and that has to apply to people involved in sport. Uh, the state government do want people to um, be active and they do want community sport to start. We're, we're seeing it um, you know, happening in regional Victoria. Practice games are already happening, training happening, um, and certainly the state government are, uh, are, are excited about that. So they do genuinely want sport to start. So uh, we think we would have a pretty um, reasonable case to say people need to get out and they need to be exercising the, the various benefits. We all love cricket. Uh, we're all involved in um, uh, community cricket because we know the, the physical benefits, the social benefits, the mental health benefits, all of those things. We'll continue to advocate that to the state government. If they keep their five kilometre rule in, we want to make sure that people can train, uh, but also they can uh, play as well. So bit of a watch your space. Um, as we know, things change on a daily basis. Um, uh, but yeah, there's no current definitive uh, position from the, uh, I guess, the Premier or Chief Health Officer as to whether or not that rule definitely will be um, uh, abolished uh, once we move to step three. Yeah, there's another, a couple of other questions that have come through which are really association specific around the time for afternoon tea and, and drinks and, and that sort of thing. That's up to your individual associations to set. Um, we've advocated on uh, to all the associations that it would be a good idea to potentially look at bowling five over blocks from one end to keep the game moving and, and to be able to get through um, the, the games fairly quickly. Um, if a ball lands in a ditch or a gutter, do we replace the ball? Well, this is no different to um, normal cricket. If the if the ball's damaged to an extent where it, it shouldn't be used, well, then you replace it. But that doesn't really impact on, on what's being happening with COVID. So as I said, that a lot of the rules won't change this year. Um, there's just a few specific ones, which we've touched on tonight for you to be aware of. But other than that, the umpire's role will still remain the same and the laws of cricket will still remain the same. One of the ones that was uh, covered um, um, in the documentation, again, just to, to, to clarify. So with that five overs from the one end, we understand um, for a lot of us have been involved in cricket for a long time. That's a bit of a controversial one. Um, it's, it's Some people say it's not real cricket because uh, you have a bowler bowling into the wind and um, all those sort of things. Um, uh, yes, it might not be perfect, but we're definitely not in a perfect year. Um, the other benefit of that is also that people aren't crossing the pitch all the time as well. So you've got people staying to their part of the ground. One of the benefits we've got with cricket, cricket's deemed as a non-contact, which is obvious, but there's a lot of other sports that are non-contact that are deemed as contact from a COVID environment because people are constantly close to each other throughout the course of the game, but netball, basketball, soccer, um, other sports that are actually non-contact in their rule. So the benefit is that we've got cricket um, is uh, separated. Yes, the slips are, are quite close to the keeper, but if you've got the five overs and you've got point and cover and mid off all staying in their positions, they're not crossing over every uh, every over. Um, that'll actually help, but also to speed up the uh, the the play, because it will. If anyone other than a player touches a ball, um, the ball is to be um, uh, uh, sanitised. So goes out for four, and a parent picks it up, throws it back in. The ball's got to be sanitised as well. So it's just those extra little breaks that um, um, that are going to be in place, particularly in that uh, that first half of the season, as we said. The more things that can be done to sort of speed up uh, the game. Uh, another one that sort of came up through the earlier session that we had today was about penalties at association level as well. We'd encourage associations to, I guess, to, to talk through those, the, the normal sort of um, penalties for not getting through your overs in time. There might need to be a little bit of a review or flexibility there at association level just to monitor 
Um, that, um, especially if you're not bowling the five overs from one end, the extra breaks during the day may just stretch out the normal the normal sort of time limit um, that uh, that you'd have compared to a normal uh, one-day game throughout a, a regular season as well. There's a couple of questions, Paul, that have come in around the five-over blocks, um, how it works with the umpires being responsible for one set of stumps. So if there's two umpires, obviously the umpires wouldn't change in, so they're still responsible for their own set of stumps. If there's one umpire, well, the, that umpire is responsible for setting up the stumps. Um and then they're just responsible for the one at their end that they're at. And then the square leg umpire, as I discussed earlier, would then come in and sanitise if they need to um, fix the stumps for a run out um, or, or someone being bowled. Someone's come in and said five over blocks, unnecessary complication, doesn't take time. Uh, yeah, it, it's up to each individual association. There, there, there's evidence from, from associations that do it last year that it can save up to 40, 40 minutes in a game. Um, it just depends on how prepared the players are to, to move through the overs and, and keep the game moving. Um, yep. It definitely has saved time on the we've seen uh, over, um, over the course yep. of um, mostly done at junior level, so junior formats, etc. cetera, but, um, but it definitely has uh, saved time. But again, it's just another solution there for, um, uh, for, uh, for associations to consider. And then with uh, umpires signing the scorebook, um, our advice is to try and limit the, the touch points and it's only the scorer that should sign the scorebook. However, we do understand that in the lower grade, you do get multiple people accessing the scorebook because there aren't generally dedicated scorers in those grades. So provided the umpire um, either uses their own pen, um, that would be fine for them to score, use the scorebook. Um, any equipment that's used does need to be wiped down. So if they're sharing the scorer's pen, it needs to be wiped down before you score the, uh, sign the scorebook. I wasn't doing static. I can see there. Sorry, just muting um, Cork Margo there. But um, uh, are umpires required to remind captains about the ball? Sorry, there's more questions coming up. I think that was about the ball cleaning. Um, yeah, so again, that could be a scorer's uh, role or umpire's role. But um, um, the initial advice that came down from uh, Cricket Australia was on a time based, and we sort of felt that that was going to be a little bit more complicated. So putting in a, t a 10 overs um, becomes a little bit uh, easier for the scorers just to, uh, to yell out. Um, yep, break after this over. Um, but uh, yeah, it's probably working through with the um, with the scorers and the umpires as to how that's best handled. But um, but ideally, the um, the scorers are yelling out as well. Yep. So the umpires should also be mindful of how many overs are gone. So every 10 overs, it, it, it's pretty easy to follow. 10, 20, 30, 40. 10, 20, 30, 40 for one day games or at up to 80. Um, with regards to changing the ball, again, that doesn't change with COVID. It, it, if the fielding captain requests or, or wants to change the ball, it's up to the umpire. It's ultimately up to them to decide whether or not the ball needs to be changed or not. That's part of the laws of cricket. Um, we wouldn't have thought there'd be clubs um, breaching significant social mm -hmm. distancing um, to, to make it dire. Again, they're in this as much as what anyone else is, and they understand that if um, there's significant breaches and that, that cricket can actually be taken away from us, we, we need to consider ourselves lucky to be out there. I know the clubs do, the associations do, so we'll all be working together to ensure that we're doing the right thing. Um, if there is a significant issue, clubs are advised to contact local authorities, whether that be the police or their local council. Um, but if an umpire feels that there is a significant issue, put it in your, your captain's report. Uh, there was a question from VJ about the QR code uh, check-in process. So all the clubs will be going through, and, the, and it's a home club requirement to have the... Um, it's for contact tracing purposes. So for those in uh, regional uh, Victoria in particular, and I guess those that um, uh, got out in the, the break uh, uh, between the lockdowns, um, a lot of restaurants might have had a check-in process where you'd scan your phone. Um, anyone, so if you don't have a, uh, an iPhone or a smartphone, someone else's phone uh, can be used to, to check you in. But when you arrive at a game, so this is for, for anyone, for players, volunteers, umpires, it's just actually to, to go over to the QR code um, and there'll be a couple of questions, which is just really name and contact details. So that way, if there is a, a COVID outbreak uh, or someone's just um, diagnosed from COVID um, that was at that uh, particular day, the Department of Health and Human Services needs to know immediately um, the people that were there. So that include umpires, players, etc. So it'll just be a bit of a uh, process to immediately get there. Clubs all um, are encouraged to have that uh, either at an obvious um, entry point um, that might be near the canteen if they've got the canteen open, near the scorebook. 
but um, uh, and ideally associations might sort of um, uh, do a bit of a process where they identify each of the clubs uh, where they're going to have their um, uh, their check in. But it should be fairly obvious on arrival just to go up and um, and it takes about 15 seconds to basically put your name and uh, phone number in uh, once you've uh, scanned the QR code. With regards to holding the, the ball in a breaking play, whether that be uh, you're off for, for rain or extreme weather or it's um, at the at the tea break and it's a two-day game, um, the advice is that the captain or the, the, the fielding side uh, maintains um, possession of the ball and we've actually put in there, they should realistically put it into a, either a Ziploc bag or the, or the box that they got it out of to keep on the, the scorer's table. Um, that way it's uh, it's not being tampered with, but also other people <laughs> aren't um, coming into contact with it. If it's um, in between days, well, then the home club keeps hold of it. And again, they put it into a container um, that uh, they can hold it onto it until the, um, the following week. There's a question about which QR code is the best one to use. There's certainly, uh, um, we would recommend the Microsoft one. Um, we've got uh, the process there, but uh, but again, there's others out there that uh, the clubs can use. So it's an individual club uh, decision uh, as to which one uh, they use. But um, uh, we're certainly recommending that. Technically, they could use a manual process, but we're for obvious reasons, we're um, not recommending that. But it's just really about that uh, the club needs to be able to immediately if they get a call from DHHS uh, identify who was there on the day so there's guidance there on our website for clubs so that website that you can see there club support COVID-19 there's some uh, links there to um the, to the setup of the QR code um Ian there's a question about um uh, we clarified how the umpire will be paid again that's up to the associations our, our advice is cashless our advice is that um uh, the associations would pay the umpires and, and invoice the clubs but again, that's an association call. Uh, if they want to continue as they currently are, continue to um, to have uh, cash payment and get the players to pay their five or ten bucks or whatever they're um, uh, going to uh, going to pay through to the captain, and the captain passes that on. You know that's uh, that's possible and not ideal in a COVID environment, obviously. Um, and we'd encourage associations to look at uh, different ways this summer of doing it. But yeah, association call. Tony's uh, mentioned with going to an EFT uh, well, system. Yep. In the RDCA, yep. yep. Um, with regards to multiple players coming out the square league, you don't need to sanitise the stumps and the bales every time a new umpire comes out. What happens is the umpire, any umpire at square league, they fix the stumps and then sanitise their hands. Players are regularly sanitising their hands throughout the game and just when they fix the stumps, they re-sanitise their hands. You don't need to sanitise the stumps every time um, the, the, the bales are knocked off or, or the stumps are, are dislodged. Um, and uh, I know a couple had sort of looked at uh, even for the ball, um, you know, having a little Ziploc bag, uh, and it can be put in a Ziploc bag for a break as well. So that's just a, a little bit of a, um, uh, a different option for uh, uh, that had been suggested in one of the um, one of the general forums. Actually, it wasn't the, the umpire forum earlier today, but uh, another way of um, looking at um, yeah, who the uh, w what could be done for the ball during breaks I as well. See I see, Michael, you've got your hand up. Is that for a question, signalling buys? Um, if it's a question, take yourself off mute and, and feel free to, to ask it. No. No. Well, I reckon we've covered off a lot of the questions that have come through. We will hang around for a few more minutes afterwards if people don't have them. Um, but I, I want to thank everyone for their attendance and participation tonight. Um, please stay safe when you get back out on the on the field. And um, and as a former batsman, please remember, if you're in doubt, give it not out. Have a good night. <laughs>